So I would like to welcome all of you to the first ever panel discussion at a LVM developer meeting. We have a very esteemed panel here who's gonna talk about interprocedural optimizations. Um, and I'm just gonna go ahead and let them each introduce themselves. Do you wanna introduce yourself? Well, I'm Dale Martin. <laughs> uh, I work for MathWorks in Boston. We make MATLAB and Simulink, if you don't know what MathWorks is. That's all I'm gonna say about myself. Uh, Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa Johnson. Um, I work at Google on compiler optimization. And um, for, in LLVM, I've done a lot of work with um, bringing up an LTO in the LLVM compiler. Um, and at Google, I work on PinLTO, profile-based optimization. Um, I've been doing compiler optimization for a very long time, um, both at Google and before. Hi, everyone. I'm Philip Reams, uh, currently at Azul Systems. I bring sort of a weird twist to this panel in that what I work on is a JVM. Uh, most of the IPO we do is speculative whole world stuff at the JVM level, so we actually do relatively little in LLVM itself. Uh, I have strong opinions on how things should be done in LLVM, but that doesn't mean I'm actually the one doing them at the moment, so I want to be careful about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll save the rest of it later. Chandler? Uh, so I'm Chandler Crew. I've done lots of things with LLVM. I work at Google on C++ and LLVM. Uh, relating to kind of interprocedural optimization, I've worked a bunch on inlining and fixed point optimization and trying to understand how to do kind of uh, more pairwise interprocedural optimizations and using graph theory to structure optimizations. I, I, I tend to really like getting into the, the kind of like right way to do like interprocedural optimizations, what, what's gonna be really like, you know, scalable and effective long-term. That sounds good. Uh, hi, um, my <laughs> name is Johannes. Uh, I work at uh, Argonne National Lab in Chicago. And um, I actually, over the summer, worked with a couple of students on interprocedural optimizations in LLVM. Uh, we'll talk later today at this, like in a, in a talk here. We have a tutorial tomorrow, so I'll, I'm actually like, working on it. I try to make it better because they, I have also very strong feelings about it and very special use cases for it. So um, I'm looking forward to get people more, like, get more input of what people, what people think about it right now, what people think we should get into in Sonic. All right. So with those introductions, I guess, um, the idea here is that this is gonna be a really interactive session. There is a microphone set up right there. You can walk up to it to ask questions if you have them. And there's a microphone that we can pass around if you're not near that mic. Um, Johannes wrote out a list of questions that are the questions that I'm gonna ask, but I hope that we ask one, and then you're so engaged that it just flows from there. That's the idea, so. Please. <laughs> yes, so please make it interactive. All right, so I'm, I think this is kind of a softball question, but sure. let's see. All right, so uh, what are the current and potential problems with IPO and LLVM? You, you, start? Start? you seem like the obvious person to take <laughs> yeah. that one. So the problems are uh, a lot of the things are actually run very little, very late on like very few like actual functions. So we run it after inlining. So a lot of like potential candidates for interprocedural optimization are gone um, because we inline them fully. And um, that actually hides a lot of bugs that are in the current code, like a lot of bugs in the current code. Like any like IPO that is maybe not interprocedural scholar, uh, scholar constant propagation is really buggy and really bad. And um, we have, like the positioning right now is my main concern. Like I think the pipeline is just centri centered on inlining, inlining first, and then whatever is left, we might like deal with IPO there. And like we have to, like I would like to, and I think we have to change our thinking to go to IPO first, and then whatever is left, we inline, because it can save compile time, it can improve our, improve our reasoning, and it opens up like a whole different dimension of things we could do. Do you mean bugs in, in IPO passes? Yes, okay. and it, even like you file them, there is no interest. Uh, people don't like people don't care like right now because <laughs> they, those things like argument promotion, like on the whole test suite in Spec 2006 hits like 300 times or like mm -hmm. less than a thousand in total with all of all of the things. So it literally never like actually triggers. I have numbers on those things, mm -hmm. and I'm like 
Okay, if it never triggers, obviously those bugs stay hidden for a long while, but they're there. And that is just one example of it. So building on that a little bit, one of the things I've noticed looking at sort of existing implementations of transformations in LLVM is we have a very strong tendency to handle interpretational cases for particular methods that matter to somebody. So where this shows up is we have in the optimizer all kinds of special casing of the semantics of mem set and mem copy and you know <laughs> mem star slash you know other special functions from libc and related places. But looking at them, almost all of them are things that actually are generic that just there's some particular property that function has. And when it was implemented, we didn't generalize. This is one of the things that really bit us quite a bit, because one of the things we do fairly heavily is we have some handwritten abstractions and intrinsic methods on our front end that we want to then annotate with all of these nice, you know, annotations, attributes, metadata for describing good optimization. And yet we found is most of the even existing attributes didn't really drive optimizations once we started really looking into it until we went and found the places that were hard-coded and generalized them. You mean, you mean it's not good to have an attribute called malloc <laughs> for <laughs> functions that aren't called malloc? Uh, that's a slightly different issue, but related. <laughs> like we, we literally have an interprocedural attribute called malloc-like, and the semantics are, well, you know, the semantics that malloc has. Yes. <laughs> that, I think that's actually how it's specified in the Langrad. And it's worse than that, of course, because it's the malloc semantics the, that each person thought malloc had. Yes. Which is a non-overlapping set in many cases. Right. It's a contradicting but, set. Yes. A lot of attributes have that problem. Oh, absolutely. So you would essentially like a richer set of these attributes and have them kind of so, be able to sort of compose up the type of so behavior that you're Yes, absolutely. To. Yeah. But it also ties heavily into the point Johannes was making about testing. Yep. Because things aren't generalized, when they trigger, they trigger in very narrow specific cases, which means there can be bugs in the, the cases that do trigger that no one ever hits, and thus they never get fixed. Wordsworth, I also disagree with your, your plan for IPO first, but we can come back to that. Let's come on back. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, does anybody have any questions John's been waiting. Yes. Oh, here we go. I, I, I happen to recognize John, but this is a plea to everyone else who comes up to the microphone. If you could say your name before you talk, because it's actually really hard to see everyone out here. Yeah. Blair, Hi, I'm uh, John Glasses. McCall. Mm -hmm. I work on the uh, Clang and Swift compilers. Um, I, in the Swift compiler, we've got an, this is a somewhat different angle from, from what you were talking about before. I hope it's still interpreting. Um, in the Swift compiler, we've gotten pretty really interested in sort of pull-oriented compiler design. Um, the idea, like, it's it's really good for incremental compilation in general, but also just, you know, um, a lot of a lot of other sorts of things that are on our on our agenda. And uh, uh, a lot of things in the compiler fit in very well into that sort of model where you just have like a function and it has sort of dependencies and that sort of thing. And interprocedural optimization is really one of the major places where it feels like it kind of falls down. And I was wondering if this is something that you guys have thought a lot about, if, there, if, you, if you think it is something that like um, is intractable to solve or whether there are uh, ways of approaching interprocedural optimization that are still compatible with a pull-oriented design. Um, I haven't thought a lot about this. I think you have as well, coming from the JVM side. Um, my, my, my perspective comes from a, a, a C++ and, and Swift is very similar model. And I think that there is an important kind of, uh, uh, I'm very sorry for this pun, it really wasn't intended. There's an important parallel to draw between parallelizing interprocedural optimizations and allowing them to be pull-oriented or on-demand, which is another way of, I think, phrasing the same thing. So, so in both cases, you want to try and isolate in different interprocedural optimizations without constraining what transformations they can apply in ways that make them ineffective. Uh, because that allows you to, in, in the on-demand case, do an incremental amount of interprocedural optimization, and in the parallel case, it allows you to run them on two threads. Um, 
I think that the, the best way I've come up with for doing this involves using graph theory. And so in particular, the idea of being able to partition the regions of the interprocedural graph that connect two procedures allows us to reason about the interprocedural optimizations that might impact them. So one of the goals with uh, the, the uh, call graph that I added, and I'm, I'm sorry for the name, but the call graph that I added for the new pass manager was to actually track all of the connectivity between two procedures in a way that actually forms a, a much more full graph. And if you can then find kind of unrelated subgraphs of it, you can likely do most interprocedural optimizations independently, which means in parallel, but also on demand. Uh, but it requires rephrasing all of your interprocedural optimizations, not as whole program, but as some kind of graph operations where you actually think about what, what fragment of the graph you actually need access to. Um, and the, the theory that we talked about when building this was uh, basically you need the entire subgraph that you're a part of, like everything below you. And you need everything above you, but you don't need un, unrelated siblings. Um, and for incrementality, this probably works pretty well. And if you have enough fan out, this also works well for parallelism. Uh, but it's, a, it's just a huge rethink of how most of the interprocedural optimizations do, uh, do their work. Argument promotion and inlining are the only two that really work this way right now. Maybe a couple others. Attributor works in a pull fashion. Not really. Oh, it, you see, you see what you want, and it pulls in all the information it needs. Not more, not, not less. So, uh, no, not really. Anyways, <laughs> so can I ask a clarifying question, Chandler? Um, in these questions and and what you just said, you mentioned the new pass manager. Is that the one that's like three or four years old? Is that the one we're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, as opposed to the decade old. Okay, okay, all it's, right. It's, Thank it's you. much newer in that sense. <laughs> that, that's true. Okay. Thank you. Did anybody else on the panel want to respond to John's question? Uh, so I don't know if this directly gets at your question, but the analogy I'll draw to the JVM world is we do speculative whole world optimization. And one of the challenges we run into is the cost of correction when that speculation turns out to be false at runtime, which has a lot of analogies to incremental recompilation when you have already computed interprocedural results and you change one method somewhere in the program and want to recompile. One of the very practical set of trade-offs that I don't have good theory to describe is that we end up being somewhat selective about what facts we, choo we choose to use across method boundaries, specifically to control how painful the optimization event is and how much recompilation work we have to do when a particular fact is found to not be true at runtime. That like very delicate balance of what, where is their profit and where do you stop propagating so as to control the incremental rebuild cost is one that will take a lot of very delicate negotiation and I don't really have any good theoretical framing for. Anyone else on the panel do? So, so related to that, like if when, you can disagree with all you want, but the attributor, <laughs> as I will show it later, will pull in information that it needs. Like you, you see that, okay, I want to know about this value and it will pull in everything it needs to reason about that value and nothing more. So like you can like parallelize that if you want to, but you can also, um, like with regards to speculative, uh, speculative things, you can tell it to ignore, let's say, non-exact uh, non definitions. Like let's pretend everything is internal, you see all the call sites and the code you see is actually executed, like be speculative. And then after the fact, you can determine what kind of transformations were affected? You, you basically get a dependency graph that tells you all about what is affected by what. Like it will also tell you if this information is at runtime false, what was affected by that information. You get you have that at at some point. We, uh, like the attributor builds it for you this dependency graph, and you know what to kind of recompile if you would go down that road, or you know what to internalize. Which functions do you have to copy, make a local copy of, to and what do, does that gain? How much annotations, how much information do you gain by doing that? And this whole dependency model, having those dependencies around for various purposes, I think is, is very powerful uh, as, as a tool because like, yeah. yeah. 
So tracking the dependencies is absolutely a necessity if you're gonna do any form of incremental uh, recompilation. Uh, in my world, this is the optimization and recompilation. Yeah. But A, it turns out there's certain methods and facts about them that spread into everything. And if those facts aren't actually that useful and it's a commonly changing method, that's a really unfortunate thing to do. So figuring out the granularities where you don't want to propagate interprocedural facts to allow faster incremental rebuild, I think is a really interesting problem that as I said, I just don't have a good solution. To. I don't have a heuristic either. I just have a way to like actually implement it. Yeah. So <laughs> if we would have a heuristic, you have all the information you need. Mm -hmm. All right, shall, shall we let the audience Thank pose you. another question? Yeah, so I want to go back to the the very beginning when you were Corey? talking. Yeah, can you say your, your name, name, please? Oh, yeah, so my name is Hector, and I work on uh, loop optimizations. Um, so I want to ask about inlining. And uh, in particular, I heard that a way to, I heard something about let's disable all inlining, and probably I'm wrong, uh, so that we can, we, we should do everything interprocedurally. And, uh, um, is that a statement in terms of, you know, we want to do this just in terms of like being able to test the interprocedural optimizer better to expose bugs, or more of a statement that we should go more toward the interprocedural, for example, loop optimization as opposed to relying on lining uh, to expose the contest within a loop nest and so on? Because I see that being very difficult to apply a loop optimization in an interprocedural fashion. And perhaps what you really want to say is that you want to limit inlining in a contextual fashion. So if you are, for example, inside a loop, okay, do more inlining because we need it at the point. And perhaps later you, you may want to outline because you want to do something more interprocedural. Uh, can you clarify your so points on that? I, I never tried to say don't inline at all. What I tried to say is inline late and change the heuristic. Right now our heuristic is if you, like if it's small, like it, it favors inlining over non-inlining generally, and it tries to, like, like there are certain cases where you reasonably want to inline, like loop optimization. You have like two functions calls next to each other, they both have a loop. You might want to inline because you can like do fancy things with the two loops next to each other. So that is great. But um, as, as shown with the, uh, with the, um, the work at, uh, that Billy did and is presented in the student research competition, just having better information on the function boundary gives you a lot of benefits LTO can provide you, though it is not the inlining per se that LTO does. Like LTO's way to provide you those benefits is usually through inlining, because we don't have good attribute deduction on functions enabled by default. So, but if you would have that, you get a lot of those benefits. That is, for those functions, you don't need necessarily the inlining to get the benefits, but you will always need inlining for like various reasons. I'm not trying to like say no inlining. I would. My comment was if you do IPO first, you can sometimes at least get away with doing the analysis once and then distributing the result and to all end call sites instead of inlining at end times and doing the analysis end times or the, also the transformation and all of that. So you might actually like save time by doing IPO. So um, for people that weren't at that talk, oh, yeah. I'm gonna give you 15 seconds to summarize what you just said in terms of the benefits of 15 seconds. Yeah. Okay. All right. So <laughs> yeah. in, instead of instead of like inlining at delta at link time the uh, functions you call in other translation units, what we did is we generated annotated headers that is the function signature with additional information. Like this this argument is not captured. This function is read only, and we distributed those headers such that. The, we don't inline those calls, but we have still more information than nothing. Like they are not barriers anymore. We know something about them, and those information were like derived at like while we compiled the other translation unit. And in the talk, the point that you were making was that they claimed that they got at least fifty percent of the benefit that they would have gotten from inlining just from this approach over LTO, right? Something like that. It, it wasn't clear to me because I was at the talk. It was very yeah. interesting. So. Um, it wasn't clear to me that those replace the benefit you get from inlining. I mean, I feel like if you combine those two things, and I was asking the speaker you, about that, that you could actually multiply yes. your benefit. They, they're kind of compatible. So it's not clear to me that those are actually replacing not the benefit them, no, you get from no. inlining. Um, but I do think, I mean, 
I think inlining brings a lot of benefits. I, I think that it would be good to rely less on inlining um, and have stronger interprocedural optimization sites. So you don't need, because you can't always inline infinitely. And, um, you know, if we do something, one of the, I'm probably jumping ahead, cloning maybe a little bit more, um, okay. things that, you know, can provide some of, uh, some of the benefits you get from inlining, but without. Inlining is it's always a crutch, right? Yes. It, yeah. it, it absolves us from needing to have more principled optimizations. Right. Um, it's still useful, mm -hmm. but it's it's a little risky when you do when you rely on it too much. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we, we've classically had all of our invariants that we compute on function attributes instead of having them be able to exist within a function body, and that means that and that's that's one of the reasons why inlining is so difficult in LLVM. If we had a better way of expressing invariants and properties within a function body, we'd probably have fewer. Uh, kind of conflicts between the inliner and these kind of semantically aware optimizations. So Chandler makes a wonderful point there, by the way, uh, because that's one of the things that makes us really sensitive to inlining choices in an unfortunate way. I also want to argue for, we need to stop relying on inlining quite as much for a little bit of a different reason, which is I think we've pushed inlining about as far as we easily can and the things we're finding in inlining at this point are becoming harder and harder and harder to do proper cost modeling of. But half the time when you look at them through a different lens, they become a very easy IPO problem or particularly a very easy specialization problem is one of the ones I see on a very regular basis. And I very much believe in solving the easy problems five different ways before trying to solve the really hard problem in one of them. Like that's the last resort, not the first resort. But I, I'll just inject clearly, if you wanna do any code motion, if you wanna do loop fusion and things like that, like you're gonna to need to inline and run the optimizations at some point, true? Not well, code motion, not necessarily. Especially no? code I, motion. I will, I will move code into procedurally soon. Oh, okay. And I have to, yeah, because so. inlining is just not an option for me. Like, okay out of the question, so that is that is the point. So I will have to move code. Interesting. But obviously there's, the, the, the transformations, the more complicated they get, the harder it is to do, like to just like mechanically, to do all the engineering, all the plumbing into procedurally. Well, I'm not saying we should like abandon it in anyway. I'm like, yeah, true. All okay. right. Well, one of the other oh. really delicate points in terms of complexity there is it's not just implementation complexity, it's testing complexity. Like that's one of the other real challenges with doing some of the interfusional transformations that are code motion, things of that yeah. nature. For all we don't like inlining, it's at least a common transformation that's very well exercised. <laughs> it's true. All right. So hi, uh, I'm, my name is Ravi. I'm from Apple. And my interest is in uh, static code analysis. Um, so I have a question that I'm coming from that world. Um, I don't work in compilers, but more into deep code analysis. Is, there has been quite a bit of theoretical frameworks and algorithms for doing interprocedural analysis uh, being investigated over, over the years and adopted by some of those static analysis tools. Um, just to give some uh, name a few, there are things like tabulation-based uh, Shadir and Pinelli's uh, analysis, uh, the culturing-based approach, the summary-based approach, which are generally much more popular. And I find some of these being adopted in sort of exotic analysis in the compiler, like alias analysis. There have been a few experimental alias analysis that's been highly into procedure. So my question is, do you think there is also a part of compiler where the inlining is used is to emit diagnostics, um, and um, which um, in many cases is uh, it's an analysis problem, not even an optimization problem. So I wonder if we can borrow any of those general theoretical frameworks and bring them onto the compiler, what would be the barrier for that? So that we can turn things like simple intra-procedural constant propagation, let's say, not do any more work, but the framework turns it into something more inter-procedural for you. That is for sure something we should do in it. And like, the, all these like well-known techniques to do things like inter-procedural, like you, like you just go with fixed point iterations, right? You have like a data flow fixed point iteration. And, that you can like so easily like do interprocedurally as like at some point if you like blur the lines between loops and recursion and like just look at it like from a more high level standpoint, all becomes the same. So whatever we do for loops right now, if we could handle like if we handle files, 
we, we can handle like recursion. And if we can handle recursion, we can basically handle everything. So no, we, we just need to rewrite recursion into loops. Yes. It's much simpler. I'm <laughs> dead serious. I, I, I wrote up a proposal, it, it's, it's about five years old now, mm. on the early list, uh, which I, I outlined exactly what we need to do to LLVM in order to have full recursion elimination. And I would really love for someone to have time to do it. If anyone is interested in working on this, please find me. I will happily like put as many of my thoughts down as I can. But we can do this, and when we fully eliminate recursive calls, all of a sudden they are loops. And then much more, uh, I think, tractable loop transformations simply apply. True, do but, it. Through, but the like, analysis parts are literally the same anyway. Yeah, but it's easier with, with SSA and fee notes. Like, why give up SSA and fee nodes in order to formulate these things in terms of recursion when we can instead formulate recursion in terms of SSA, fee nodes, and a control flow graph, right? Like, we, we know how to represent this in a theoretical way. We just have to transform it into that instead of it being at the source level. Yeah. It, it sounds like a, a big investment into um, why, like, let's first do, like, a whole program rewrite for, to make, like, canonicalization. What, what well, it's combined? Well, I was just going to say, <laughs> compilers are all about canonicalization. Yes. Right. Like, this is a problem we don't talk about, but we all spend most of our time actually doing. Sure. For example, like the real reason to run the inliner isn't to like like or we shouldn't be running the inliner just to make code fast. It should actually be call graph canonicalization, so that you can see the call graph patterns what to do inter procedural optimization on. Now, this is not what happens today. That's what that's what should be happening in a lot in a lot of ways, right? We shouldn't be doing kind of cost modeled inlining until we're in the back end and we actually know what the cost is because on some architectures it's zero and on other architectures it's much higher than we think it is. But there's a canonicalization step that's also taking place there. So I want to build on that piece a little bit. Uh, in terms of the question about should we be using more textbook analyses, one of the things I think is a little bit missing in the static analysis world is that ability to canonicalize. And because of that, there's great links are gone to to represent things you know commonly in the analysis results. We have a compiler. We have an IR. We should just pick a canonical form mandate that and simplify the analysis problem rather than trying to re-implement every other part of the compiler in the analysis. You want a GPN optimizer? I've had to work one of, with one of those. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So our chopping block includes inlining and recursion. That's the takeaway from this so far. <laughs> Could okay. possibly and go wrong. A Sounds bit good. of disagreement <laughs> as you see. Okay, any questions out in the audience? Do you have another question? Change a little bit the, the subject. In, in terms of inter-procedural optimization, uh, what are, what's on your wish list of things that would be useful to add that LLVN doesn't yet do? So, my answer to that is not so much an interprocedural analysis, but it's a way to summarize complicated read-write sets for functions. When the user or the front end knows something about some intrinsic or core function, being able to describe that into the IR in a concise but expressible way. Note that I'm drawing the distinction here. This could be much more general and more expressive than anything we'd ever want to try to summarize as an analysis result. But I think as a building block, that's one that we're really missing today. So for me, actually, I think a lot about the LTO and how it fits in with, with uh, how IPO fits in with that. So for me, it's not as much what are we missing in IPO, but how can we exploit IPO fully within LTO mode? And so what I'm thinking about is, uh, what I think a lot about a lot is, what can we do to, um, for example, function attribute propagation? It doesn't, doesn't work help program within LTO right now. There was some work a couple summers ago on that, but it uh, wasn't completed. But I think that there's a lot of interprocedural optimizations that we don't fully exploit yet within LTO. And it needs a bit of work on 
the, um, the, NLT, the NLTO summaries, but also what would be nice is if we can, you know, we don't want to have two versions of these optimizations, one for, for the NLTO and one for full LTO. Or, um, and so it would be nice to have a way to generalize some of these you know, procedural optimizations so they work either on summary or on IR. So what's an example of one of the optimizations? You're so doing? the function attribute propagation okay. doesn't work whole program with NLT right now. There's some uh, infrastructure in the summaries and some of that work was started and there's some patches, but there um, it was a GSOC student and didn't ever get completed. So there's some initial work there and just it needs somebody to pick it up. <laughs> need some love. Uh, just like we said earlier, interprocedural code motion, like moving code, um, that is on my short list. And actually, it's a little bit more than that. It's like um, a, a powerful version of the partial inline, like of the function unswitcher, like early exits with like a little bit of maybe side effects. Like take small part of the like you can you can show that you take a, a, a small path through the function to the callee. So like inline that small path, that kind of code motion style where you move a certain amount of like code over and replace the call. Uh, it's like, 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 yeah, early exits. Like if you can do like constant propagations at that call site and you see early exit, you move the whole, you move the whole early exit over, even if it like with the whole thing. And the other thing is function boundaries. Like what arguments are passed, why? Rewriting that. Like, the user had some idea, but that has like, let's forget about that. We rewrite code all the time. Let's forget about the fact that the user passed these three arguments and then like that in the struct and that one loads from here or whatever. Um, take the whole thing and I have like a prototype that builds like a, um, that builds a dependency graph between all the arguments you pass in and all the arguments you use them in all of that. And then that does a min cut over that to determine what is passed, when, where do, where do I recompute things and so on and so forth. because. There's no need for us like uh, internal like uh, internal symbols to, to keep that boundary. If we inline it, it's gone anyway. We can like rewrite that boundary arbitrarily, and we shouldn't make use of that. Which is code motion again. Like all of these things I have on my short list and that wish for, and I'm going to do next is code motion. And I only worked on the whole attributor stuff and all of the function attribute deduction because you can't move code if you don't have good information about like memory access patterns, aliasing, and other things. And for, like I need that dereferenceability information to actually move stuff around. And, and, and without that, you can't. And that is, that is uh, my, my short list. My short list is boring. Instead of partial inlining, I want an outliner. So, so not bad. I'll agree with both of these guys. <laughs> uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting patterns that can be phrased as partial inlining, they can be phrased as outlining, they can be phrased as specialization. <laughs> But like simple toy examples, like you have a function that takes a Boolean argument and the first thing it does is it branches on that argument and there's a true and a false. Like the fact that we don't split that into three functions, you know, the top one that just tail calls the second one and then that one almost always gets inlined into the caller mm -hmm. is just silly. Yeah. Yes. Like it shouldn't matter how big the if and the else is. That's an yes. obvious canonicalization piece. Yes. Yeah. yes. And then you get better interprocedural information because you actually expose at the call site which part of the function you call instead of like merging all the information of both branches into like a big summary and then like propagating that. So yes, I would love that. Yeah. All right. So my name's Alan. Um, I'm curious about MLIR and and uh, you know how you see this reimagining of of IPO uh, intersecting uh, the MLIR stuff. It seems like there's some conceptual aspects in common, um, just, you know, higher level abstractions and, and that kind of thing. So uh, just curious how you see that interacting. I don't know. I don't really, I, I'm not an expert at MLIR. Uh, I work in a completely different part of Google for it's worth. Uh, but my, my impression is that they're, they're, they're solving kind of very different problems. Um, that like with MLIR, you're expressing kind of really nice higher level abstractions, uh, either from a machine learning domain or from some other numerical domain. Uh, you don't have procedure boundaries there. You have like a really clean mathematical model. And the hard part is actually modeling the data layout and the mathematical model in, with enough rich information to be able to do interesting transformations. And I feel like that's, usually you don't have interprocedural problems when you have that opportunity. Um, and when we're looking at interprocedural optimizations, we're mostly trying to recover uh, optimization opportunities 
that only arise when you combine very disparate parts of your software. And, and it's, you know, there could be high level information that helps there, but as, as often as there's high level information, it's really just, you know, figuring out the nuts and bolts of how each disparate part of your software works and how to connect them together. Uh, one of the most interesting things is that interprocedural optimization should work between languages, right? <laughs> and, and so you're gonna want to lower out of something that's kind of specialized and into some very common uh, representational form so that you can move across languages. Again, you can connect these disparate parts of your software and reason about them to, to recognize optimization opportunities. And so I feel like uh, MLIR is, is trying to solve a very different class of problems from what we're solving with interprocedural optimizations. So I was asking Johannes about this at lunch, actually. <clears throat> Do you think that the whole region concept in MLIR intersects with this space at all? Or either of you, I mean, uh, anybody. You want to go? I mean, I, I, it doesn't really change my thoughts, right? Like, like there's okay. this very nice high level thing. It's great when we can represent it. I, I, I definitely feel like LLVM's IR is not great at representing regions. Mm -hmm. um, I welcome IR improvements to that kind of representational problem. Um, I don't think it comes up much in interprocedural optimization because usually we, we, we're having to reduce so far down before we can do interprocedural optimizations. So, like, my take on a lot of these regions, if you look at them, if you just like outline the region, you have like a, an internal function now, a single call site, and then you could apply all the techniques we built for, for IPO to whatever you now have. So conceptually for me, they're not too far apart. And all what we build, like frameworks and like what experience we, we gather in like IR on in actual like different functions because we don't have regions, might actually translate fairly well to, to that model. Like you like a region is then your internal function with a single call site, which is very nice for interprocedural optimization because you know all about it. Like any like internal function is already good. And and things like that. So but um Lessons learned and, and what works and doesn't work, yes. More than that, I don't know. Teresa, you look like you had a... No, I don't have... I, okay. I, I'm not familiar enough with MLIR to really okay. add on to what these guys are saying. All right. Hi, uh, I'm Nick. I work on the Linux kernel. Um, I had read this paper, um, kind of machine learning-based paper, called, I think, Machine Learning Data Structures. And it was an interesting paper. Um, and kind of the footnote they said was like, turns out that these neural networks were actually really great at, at kind of solving heuristics based problems where humans would try to come up with heuristics and not, not necessarily do like the most optimal job. And like there's other problems in computer science that are full of heuristics, like compilers. So I was curious because there's this, this common process called uh, normalization they do is you have a bunch of signals coming in and it turns out some of them are just noise, and if you get rid of them, it actually simplifies the model, and certain signals are more valuable than other signals. Um, I'm just curious, is anyone looking into any of like, the cost models of, of any of these things and trying to apply machine learning to try to come up with either simpler models or better models than what we have today? So I know that there are um, some people that I work with who, um, who are looking at um, LF, uh, machine learning based uh, compiler tuning. And I think that there's a number of, like you mentioned, I mean, any place that there's been heuristics and we've tuned and tuned and tuned, I mean, there's, I think that there's a really great opportunity for looking at other ways of trying to set those values. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's, it's, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting area and I think that there's going to be a lot of, um, I'm starting to see some papers come out on ML-based, you know, tuning of various pieces, parts of the compiler, and I think that there's going to be some uh, interesting work there that can be done. So another one I'll mention, this is a couple of years dated in terms of my knowledge, but I know a couple of years ago there was some very nice work being done on auto-tuning uh, compiler settings and flags, particularly workloads. Uh, the general result I remember seeing is they were very good at getting better performance for one workload, but they didn't always generalize well. That was the problem that at least a couple of years ago, a lot of the work seemed to be running into is that you know you can train on a particular workload, get very optimal set of flags for that workload in its current form. But as that workload evolved, or as you tried to move it to new workloads, you basically had to completely retrain all of the sort of parameters that you used for the optimal performance. And 
that was the thing that at least a couple of years ago, the papers seemed to be struggling with. I'm not sure how much that has changed in the last couple of years. Well, I, I feel like for machine learning, like generalization is like kind of bread and butter and very well understood. Like you don't want a model that is specific to one set of inputs, right? Like you do want a model that generalizes and that's kind of how you score things. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a follow-up question is, let's say, you know, I come up with research I show, I can beat the cost model on the inliner in LLVM. How do I contribute that to LLVM? And how do we invalidate or like measure over time that like this thing is now outdated? Would so, you want that? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, how do you debug it? Yeah, I, I think it'd be interesting. It'd be totally that. interesting. Yeah. yeah. So Perfect. one of the things is a machine learning model that like gets awesome inlining results. If nothing else, it would inform the conversation as to what the important factors are. And driving that human scale interaction is one of the places I think there could be very near term high value. Yeah. Uh, the, one of the challenges in the space is figuring out whether you have a good set of parameters by itself is an extraordinarily expensive operation because you have to A, do the compile, but B, you have to then run the workload under a meaningful, like, a meaningful set of data for long enough to get something representative and that itself is a really hard problem. Because like you've got to do that across, you know, numerous architectures, numerous microarchitectures. Uh, you know, you probably need hundreds of samples each to get something statistically significant. Like it just that's hard. I don't know, I think we could collect a lot of data. It's just like you're saying, I think maybe making sure all the cases, all the architectures are covered. That's yeah. so that's where it comes but, I mean, how does challenge. anyone make any change to any cost model today? Because couldn't the same argument be applied to that? Painfully. Yes. 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 Because much. whatever you change, like it improves like those 20, it like like performance suffers on those 20, and in between, like you see all the other results. Like, so so and inlining I, is a oh I'm sorry. Oh. I would say inlining is a particularly difficult one because it's such a huge lever. I mean, that's probably the biggest lever of performance. And for a lot of, a lot of the reasons we're saying, I mean, we get idea through inlining. Because but yeah. Everything it's a like if it one. doesn't trigger, a lot of things will fail. And if you do it too like too aggressively, you run into other problems. So like very I easily. I don't want to take more time here. I'd love to have a conversation offline about why I don't think you can actually train inlining heuristics in any way like this. There's a really great long conversation about that, but it's not really that specific to IPO. If if there are no other questions, I'm happy to come back to it. But there's like I don't know. It feels like we're going to go down a rat hole. There's there's a ton of other things we haven't even touched on yet. Yep. Thanks. So I will touch on. It's so just on the like tying like, back nope. to my point. So tying back to the point earlier on why we need to look at things that aren't inlining is precisely because of this evaluation problem. Yeah. We've hit the point where figuring out whether a change is profitable in inlining heuristics is an immensely expensive thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. But there are so many other optimizations we don't do or don't do too often, or like we basically neglected for a long while. Like argument promotion, I said earlier, it applies like a thousand times in like very, not big, but in a decent amount of code, it applies like v only a few times. So basically not, not at all. And it doesn't apply for various reasons, including like the cost heuristics is triggered towards standard pair. And if you have anything that is more complex than a standard pair, you're pretty much screwed. I, I think you just misunderstand how many standard pairs certain code bases have. <laughs> Wait. I'm not saying you shouldn't optimize standard pair. I'm no, saying no. you should optimize more than standard but pair. But understand, the solution to all problems is a hash table. And in C++, hash tables are built on top of standard pair. And you think I'm kidding, but I actually remember when Nick rewrote most of our current promotion, and I know what the test cases were that motivated him. And it's like super STL-based C++ code. Our current promotion is just awesome at it. Yeah. The magic constant three is in there, so yes. pairs <laughs> work great. <laughs> but pairs are rather like important. It's test three. Hmm? I was just saying, but pairs are rather important. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, shall we go back to the list? I, I'm assuming that you had some intention in this list. Is that a good assumption? Sure. Let's go with that. <laughs> Unless somebody's got a burning question, I am happy. We to have go like on. a few minutes left. I think yeah. like five or so. Okay. Oh, well, let's get some audience questions in here. Yes, yeah, so let's let's get right. another question right, too. Let's go. Ask, ask the question you've been you've been waiting to ask that you're afraid yes. to ask. It's okay. This is this is the moment. Crickets. 
I've got one I've been oh, burning gosh. to ask. It's right here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, how does the new pass manager <laughs> impact IPO? Oh, so <laughs> I know that that one's probably, like, okay. you're the obvious <laughs> responder, so, but <laughs> I, have, I have to start with this one because I actually think the one of the huge impacts here is going to be the fact that that project is now finally almost over and we can stop splitting development effort between the old and the new, and we can stop telling people at conferences, like, come back in a year when this is done, which is what we have de facto been telling people. I am super excited about the progress we're going to see around IPO in the near future, simply because we've eliminated that, you know, engineering burden of having both of them existing in parallel. You understand, though, to do that, we have to fix the register allocator bug. That's, that's like, the proximate thing blocking us from flipping the default right now. <laughs> well, so I think we've actually already made that transition. I realize that we haven't like actually thrown the flag in upstream LLVM, but given how many people in this room are now running for compilers that have the new pass manager on by default and have shipped things. We, we, had, to turn, we had to turn the new pass manager off for address sanitizer uh, because it crashes LLVM in the register allocator. Uh, like it, it Sadly, we still we, we, we keep finding just how long the tail is. <laughs> but anyways, well, we'll get there, we'll get there. You, you're absolutely right, but I'm also at this point happy to take patches that only work in the new patch manager. Yes. Like a year ago, that wouldn't have really been a real thing. Now the, and eh, it's okay if it doesn't work in the old patch manager as long as it doesn't break anything, mm -hmm. is a reasonable review comment. Yep. So, but getting back to the question about like, <laughs> What does like the new pass manager like help or like, like how does it interact with IPO? Like as far as I can tell, we copied the old pipelines fairly like we copied them just over and didn't like modify them much, which leaves us again with let's do canonicalization, the inline a loop, and then do like interprocedural after. That is the current that, that's not actually the pipeline. Sure it is. No no that's that's, that's really not the pipeline. Sure it is. No, like right now we interleave the canonicalization with the inline. And oh, that's yeah. super important. It's the interleaving that's important. My, my point was the IPO is after that loop, after the inliner is done. Not for argument promotion. Oh, sh argument promotion runs late. It also runs with the inliner. In the new press manager? And the old one. Huh. I have never run, like, seen it run with the, it, with a, the inliner. It, it's a call graph SCG, SCC pass. Um, I knew about and that. it builds it builds the SEC. Yeah. Um, it's the same SEC that the inliner is processing. So as you're inlining, you're also incrementally argument promoting. Okay. Um, the original attribute inference is in the same vein. So the original goal for the IPO phase was all to run as SEC passes that look at uh, kind of the the call graph structure and run interleaved with the inliner, so that they do have some opportunity to see things before they get inlined away. Um, and the big problem we had was that they literally run on the wrong side of the inliner within the SEC passes. And because of how the roots work and what they look at, it's, it's they're one stage too late. Um, and it had a lot to do with the iteration structure we have for running the inliner. It, it's, it's, it's mostly historical accidents. It's not like there's this like clear intentional design that led to this. It's, it's a bunch of accidents. What about, what about the, like you, like you have the um, call graph SEC passes? They're supposed to only look at their SEC and whatever they call directly, right? Uh, the new pass manager tries to relax at some. Okay, that is that is one of the yeah. things I wanted to like get at because exactly. the old pass manager was quite restrictive. Like, yes. depending on what you want to do with IPO, that might be fine. But the, like, there are certain things where you want to like look at other things as well. Like, you want to propagate information from callees to callers the other way around. Like, and not all of that would actually work in yes. an old style SEC pass. Absolutely. And, and okay, if that and, is. And, and in particular, the inliner always violated this and we just never got called out <laughs> on it. So the, the inliner has always looked at callers while processing the callee. It, it, it kind of peaks in both directions. And, and you, can, you can trigger some really annoying behavior. So the old inliner would sometimes lose functions and, and like fail to actually finish inlining the calls inside those functions because they would get disconnected from the call graph in weird ways. Um, and it didn't tend to matter in practice, but like, yeah, we have, we have so many bugs. Which, that'll be one of the things that the new pass manager has the biggest impact on, is just, it's so much less fragile, or at least 
the sources of fragility have been more recently beat through. There hasn't been as much time to accrue new, for, new sources of fragility. They're telling us we're done. All right, yes, I guess well, we yeah, are done early. Unless you had one last bullet point. No? I'm good. Okay, yep. well, I would like to thank the panel and um, thank you, the audience, also, for your excellent questions. Thank you, moderator. <laughs>